Hello everyone, my name is Michał Maciejewski and uh, today I have the great pleasure to present to you my talk entitled When Models Query Models. Um, let me start with expressing my gratitude to organizers and allowing me to participate remotely to Europe Python. I wish I could join you, but some um, personal issues block me from that. Um, this is work carried out at ETH Zurich uh, together with my supervisor Yasmin Smaic, uh, Bernard Alpman and Douglas Martins from Culture Institute and Georgia Vallone from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. I will start by um, mentioning actually a nice coincidence because uh, today is almost 10th anniversary of Higgs boson discovery at CERN, which was possible by a great effort of engineers and scientists who built and operated large Hadron collider along with four detectors. Here we can see an uh, image of collision of beams of particles taking place in one of the detectors. And uh, by reconstructing uh, that collision and matching to um, physical models, scientists could identify as this blip here, uh, Higgs boson, being created and that proved uh, a theory created 50 years ago so that's quite incredible and that's a big step for for uh, particle physics but also our understanding of uh, matter and um, universe as a whole and how does it work let me start with just a very brief accelerator principle um, to me it's like a swing on the kids playground so we have a charged particle which is kept in circular trajectory by a dipole magnet, so just two north and south poles put on top of each other. That for a positively charged particle traveling perpendicular to that field would um, experience a force that would bend it. So we can see as a particle goes out of the screen, to turns into the middle of the circuit, a circle, and then it's turning. At some point, there is a radio frequency cavity that gives electric kick and that accelerates particle and goes round and round in the circle. And there is just this one equation, Lorentz Ford, that you may remember from uh, high school physics that is governing the movement of particles uh, with a good approximation. And what's really interesting here is that these magnets are actually super powerful. So they operate at A3 Tesla just to compare an MRI magnet would run at 1.5 Tesla, and they are, need to be cooled down to very low temperatures, like 1.9 Kelvin, which is even less than in the outer space. And that's quite uh, impressive. Um, and uh, yeah, we need quite big circle, uh, 27 kilometers in circumference, because the larger the circle, circle and the field, then we have the more powerful collisions, and the more powerful collisions, then we more we can learn about the behavior of particles and uh, with superconducting magnets, which is the objective of uh, my project design of those magnets, uh, we can reach a compact design and high fields that um, allow for building better accelerators. And it's actually not um, only a large Hadron collider, that's one to rule them all, but actually there is an entire complex of accelerators which provide particles and pre-accelerate it before going to the next stage and have different uh, experiments at CERN. But what's really striking here that, for instance, proton synchrotron was built in 1959 and is operated until today. So um, this shows that uh, the design is really important part and have to be done right and to maintain knowledge about the systems and information that is relevant to keep it operating for a long time after it was uh, put into operation. So the motivation for my project, uh, which is the design of superconducting magnets uh, for future accelerator comes from the fact that these are multi-stage iterative processes that involve various disciplines and they feature changing teams of experts and software tools that are on their own subject to have this replacement and may last, as you can see, from years to several decades. So we are aiming at a consistent, sustainable, and reproducible organization of numerical models to cons together with construction validation data uh, and tools using the process. And as you can see here, circle of large Hadron Collider, 
the futures require collider would be about four times um, bigger than LHC today. So, and that's the design and engineering effort taking place right now, and uh, I'm contributing to that. And uh, inspiration for this project, which is called Py and BSC, so Python implementation of certain NBSC concepts, where NBSE stands for Model Based System Engineering, and this is a formalized application of modeling to support system requirements, design, analysis, verification, and validation activities that start uh, in the conceptual design phase and continue throughout the long and later life cycle phases. And one of the concepts brought by NBSC is a uh, design system matrix. So we try to decompose a bigger system into subsystems, like we decompose our software solutions into uh, modules and interfaces between them. Uh, here is something pretty similar, where this matrix shows the connection and, and coupling between the systems and also definition of interfaces. So what data goes uh, to what system as they are put together. And uh, if we look into one box, which is the superconducting magnets, we can see that this is composed on its own by several submodels that also have certain dependencies uh, and exchange information between them. And when we design a magnet, we want to put together these models, but we don't want to uh, duplicate information. Of course, it's not a good practice, both in software and modeling. So instead, we want to have specialized models that are good on its own. And instead, we want to provide a query mechanism such that these models can access data between each other. And uh, that's what the uh, MBSC framework is all about. And it's especially important that we have many, many models that are at different scales. So it could be a circuit composed of many uh, magnets. It can be a magnet itself or a cable that is uh, used to create that magnet or even a strand of that cable. So that happens at different scales and we need to somehow have first of all dependency tree of these models and a query mechanism to put them together. And um, what we uh, do is uh, rely on this model based system engineering. And that's actually a concept that is, first of all, introducing a quite generic concept of a model, which is a simplified version of something. It can be a graphical, mathematical, machine learning, deep learning, or even physical representation like measurements that is abstracting the reality to eliminate some complexity such that we can focus on one particular aspect of a uh, system and its design. And uh, with MBSC, we shift system engineering uh, from documents to interconnected models so that models are queried, they generate views, and are traceable and repeatable. And if you look at typical project management pipeline, we have um, initialization, then study uh, that finishes with conceptual design reports or report telling what are the suitable solutions. If you want to realize that project, then we move to design of particular solutions, which ends with technical design report. And then we build it, with some documentation, commission, and finalize the project. And there is always procedures and report. And actually what's quite common in um, this community, but I would say even science in general is that when we write and report, we have some models, some measurements, some Excel spreadsheets, some analysis scripts, and uh, that all is put together in the report. But typically, this link is only um, available for the creator of the document. And once the document is created, we can't really trace back where this data comes from. So if we have to reanalyze something, this information might be missing, and we need to and bring it back and uh, recreate, which sometimes is even impossible when people leave or software changes and, and we can really find the particular setup that was used to create that information. So instead to these um, static documents, we proposed to introduce models and uh, with these models, be able to uh, always retrieve information, trace it back, and, and, and put it together. And that's exactly the Python MBSC framework all about. And I will talk about its microservice architecture. And uh, here, I'd like to really um, note the similarity between system and software architecture. So 
As you could see, a system architecture is represented as subsystems along interfaces uh, between them. And uh, actually, what's pretty obvious with software, a software architecture, uh, in our case, it's uh, microservices and interfaces between them. So um, there is this similarity, and in fact, we try to leverage good practices from software development and use them in system engineering to um, improve the design processes. So the framework itself is composed of several components. Um, so from user perspective, there is configuration that tells what models are involved in a particular design. This forms a model dependency graph. This graph has to be a directed cyclic graph um, so that there are no loops and we can always execute it um, from start to end. Um, as we execute these models, they are typically living in some notebooks or scripts. So uh, when we run, for instance, magnetic analysis, this would perform a model query, find its dependent models, execute them, and get that information back. And when the model is executed, so be it a notebook or a script, this is calling an electromagnetic solver to solve uh, for a particular physical quantity that we're interested in. And as you can imagine, we might have some redundant calls if two models depend on one. And if the input information is the same, we can uh, reuse that immediately by accessing a, a cache database. So all the execution of models is cached. We take certain snapshots such that we can reuse that information. And also after a study, do some analytics, like what's the fastest model, what's the most performant, which gives us the biggest margins, this uh, is still available. And uh, we um, choose notebooks because after execution of each of the nodes, we can create an HTML report and then build a book from that HTML report such that uh, we form a, a document, a, a, a bigger report. So what are the three pillars based on this uh, initial overview of the project? So first of all, we have containers for numerical models and in general for reproducible environments. So whatever we use, uh, we put it into a container and expose a generic interface. Once we have that, so that is how to use um, particular solvers. We have a model query mechanism that has two components. One is dependency tree which indicates uh, what is the dependency between different models and uh, how a change would propagate across uh, this model tree. And the cache database, so that when a cache is um, available, we just return that information. Otherwise, we just uh, need to run the model again. And the third pillar are model views, so auto-generated documents where um, we can profit from uh, notebooks and build on-demand uh, representation of our design, such that it's also available for decision makers, for managers in a convenient form. They don't need to run any code. They have a view and it's actually a, a quite cheap way of, of generating the view. And with that, we also keep track of some information for uh, reproducibility, like versions of the particular packages that we use, version of the container we use, version of software in general, so that we can always uh, redo that analysis later. So um, starting with containers for numerical solvers, um, so we have a solver which uh, is solving a particular physical problem, magnetic, mechanical, thermal. We then encapsulate in the Docker container so that we have its all dependencies and running environment. And then we provide a generic REST API to interface with that uh, solver. And that has four methods. Initialize, upload files, run these files, and download results. And we already created some uh, containers. Some are available uh, provided by other companies. Once we have that uh, numerical solver API, we can enable model query, so how to get um, information between different models. And uh, for that, we have this PyMBSC class, which is uh, building an execution query 
based on the config source model, target model, some inputs, and we can either get reports or some figures of merit uh, or artifacts if these are larger files. And as I mentioned already, in case the query is executed again with the same inputs, and the underlying model will not change. And it's not only the model, but also the dependencies. We return output from the cache database. The cache database um, is a document store, a dictionary uh, uh, document store, which is implemented in MongoDB. So we have here a, a schema with name of a model, its path, execution time, last modification, timestamp, hash of its content and contents of all dependent models, input parameters and output figures of merit or artifacts that we may want to immediately return once uh, we executed the model. So um, we chose MongoDB because uh, we may we have freedom for the dictionary fields that we don't know a priori and could have a different structure. And uh, that was quite convenient, uh, convenient choice. And uh, we have an uh, index that is based on model hash, which brings a uh, high cardinality. And that's actually the only table that we, that we need to store in our cache. So we don't need to really a relational database here. And one important thing to note, uh, once we have our model dependency tree, we realize that, for instance, a mechanical model depends on geometry, but also depends on magnetic, which also depends on geometry. So if um, we want to then find the shortest path of execution of dependency, we need to perform tree linearization, uh, which actually is, is um, inspired by the method resolution order of Python. So um, here, once we have a model that we want to execute, we need to check its state if it changed with respect to what's in cache but also whether any of the dependencies changed and uh, this we do by just going through the shortest uh, path of this tree and we don't need to uh, waste time and again if we have a cache hit we return what we had but if uh, one of the dependencies or the model itself changed we need to rerun it such that um, we uh, have current result, but with that tree renalization, we only rerun those models that changed. So that's a big gain also in, in computation. And one important step is uh, change propagation. So what this um, dependency tree and tree linearization allow for is that if, for instance, one model will change, let's say electroperimal model, and you want to rerun particle accelerator again, you will check if it's content and uh, input files and parameters changed. Um, if not, we change check all the dependencies. Uh, here we see that only something in the magnet changed. We go into a magnet, we check dependencies of a magnet. Uh, that model changed, we would only run this one, while the others return the cached results such that we can then put back together um, the entire model and run particular accelerator uh, study only on change of one particular model and update only those that that change and one thing that also brings to the third pillar which is model views once we uh, perform uh, a model re-execution uh, document a report is auto-generated and we can see it here i'd like to open now the link so if we click here we have a cdr example so conceptual design report of uh, a magnet design so we have some introduction and geometry with uh, code so that we can see what was um, used with versions of api and time of execution a table with parameters uh, with Plotly, we can still have interactive view of model results, so that's that's pretty convenient. We can zoom, we can uh, look at what we got. And the same is also for some model results where we have um, information about geometry again, uh, some input files that we can print out, so it's all available. And again, some physical results, in this case, uh, magnetic field which we can 
still read and, and check that information. So that's quite convenient for uh, everyone on the team, but also people from other groups, from other uh, systems that they could quickly check was, for instance, the peak field or our stored energy, and that could inform their design and this information is cross-referenceable and people can quickly access. Okay, so just uh, to summarize this part, so um, we have this PyMBSC microservice architecture. First step is that we have containers for numerical solvers. Um, we also allow for command line interface or, or, or REST API gRPC calls, but for those tools that we provide, uh, we package them in Docker. We uh, presented these numerical solver calls with four uh, endpoints in REST API. And then there is this PyMBSC query calls that allows models to exchange information and get data from each other. And this all goes to a PyMBSC cache that stores information on model execution so that we can, on one hand, um, retrieve it quickly if we run the model again with the same parameters. But also we can do some analytics afterwards and, and, and check our model, see how they change and, and uh, track that information. Then we uh, support two execution modes. So um, one is local execution when designers play with notebooks and do some analysis, make plots and then get um, data in the right shape that is uh, performed via Jupyter server and Python. Uh, with some virtual environment and uh, on local machine, it relies on Docker and uh, MongoDB instance. It produces a notebook output, uh, which then we can put together into a book uh, and report that uh, people can communicate outside. But that's uh, one way. The other is distributed execution. Of course, we can imagine that um, once we have certain design and we want to change parameter, we don't do it manually. We can do on-demand compute um, and here we just, um, in a way, abuse uh, GitHub CI, but by making it running with its uh, REST app on demand with certain parameters. And uh, for that, we use paid permit to execute a notebook uh, programmatically. And uh, for that, we rely either on GitHub runner or OpenShift instances to run these Docker containers and allow for um, the computation to be done on, on, on the cloud. Yeah, some uh, implementation details. So uh, as I mentioned, MongoDB for cache database, um, Docker is locally OpenShift for distributed execution, FastAPI for REST API development, that's really fast development, Petri for the virtual environment and dependencies, PaperMill and Scrapbook for notebook execution. And we create these books uh, with Jupyter book and eventually GitLab for versioning and CICD pipelines which actually is quite neat with, with poetry. So here sample pipeline that we that we use for our packages. And now I like to come to one application to show how we use that uh, tool in practice. So here is one example of um, optimization where the objective is to uh, obtain certain field quality so that particles are really focused and traveling in the desired trajectory, this uh, accelerator. Of course, we need certain safety margin. Uh, we don't want to degrade the material too much, as well as its insulation. And this is uh, taking place by optimizing a cross section of that magnet where we put certain cables uh, here around and the XY plane, and uh, we adjust the positioning angle, inclination, and number of conductors. And for this optimization, we have four models, geometry, electromagnetic, mechanical, and thermal, that run in the loop until we find, uh, with a genetic optimizer, a set of parameters that minimize all the objectives. And uh, the optimization execution is actually quite simple. So we execute models with this, that by MBSC API. So we need one line per model to retrieve figures of merit. Then they are returned as a dictionary. So put them together, um, collect also some artifacts that we may use for further processing. And we calculate scores, so one value that represents the design. And we then take the figures of merit, scores, and artifacts and, and return it as, as a result. Once we have it, um, 
we uh, can run. And the run is uh, very similar to what we see so far. So we have different solvers for different models. Uh, they have these model API calls. The optimization notebook is performing PyMBSC query calls to each of the models, combines them into one, computes a score, and that score is then stored in a cache a database. Uh, so that after an optimization run, we can retrieve it from uh, a simulation of a cockpit of, uh, of the optimizer, which in itself is a notebook. And that's, that's the cockpit where we can see uh, the progress of optimization. If we click any dot, we can see a cross section of the magnet that uh, was uh, used for this optimization and was the best uh, individual in this. Uh, genetic optimizer, we can see some parameters for that um, model, and we can also see uh, how the design variables compare to the best in, uh, individual so far. And this gives us two information. First of all, if we are hitting the limits and we, maybe we should expand the design space uh, in that variable, or we are somewhere in between and, and we are still exploring the parameter space. So putting it all together, um, with PyMBSC, we could uh, provide a query mechanism for models. So the physical connections, physical interfaces that exist in a particular system are represented in the design phase uh, when we use computer-aided design uh, with queries. And that is a very clear interface between these tools. So different components of the accelerator can query each other with that uh, tool. And uh, also within one system, different models can, can query one another. And uh, we know that the particle accelerator is a system of systems implemented as multiple project with remote queries for data exchange. And one system, uh, like a spoken system of components that are implemented in a single project with local queries for data exchange. And one important part in the design is, is, is versioning. So um, here we rely on GitLab, which is uh, a standard way of keeping track of information, where we can have a reference or main branch of the design, but also certain sub branches for particular versions of a design, which still tend to be updated. And we can keep track of that or put some tags to keep uh, uh, information about main, main changes, main uh, main versions of, of our our design. And for each of these dots, we can run a continuous integration pipeline and at the end produce this report so that with every change, we can keep track of what was done and maintain also that book as an artifact in GitLab so that uh, anyone can access it uh, rather quickly. Okay, so to conclude, um, the PyMBSC MBSC framework, which is a Python implementation of model-based system engineering concepts um, is quite generic. It's not only for supercontacting magnets, but can be used in other engineering fields. Uh, it is a set of containers with numerical models, a model query mechanism with a cache database, uh, and a model view based on Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Book for document creation. And uh, on top of that, we added a set of optimization algorithms, an interactive cockpit for multi-objective uh, multi-model optimization. And uh, one important thing is that we uh, rely on standard open source uh, software technology stack and really pay attention to testing and documenting uh, so that this solution would uh, last for years as, as, as needed. So thank you very much for your attention. It was a great pleasure to provide and deliver this talk. If you have any questions, I would be very happy to answer. We have a few minutes for questions. Um, would be to ask you if you could expand a little bit on the motivation for this project. Um, I'm curious, you know, how expensive these model API calls were to, to uh, justify this caching, caching approach. And secondly, why develop or choose PyMBSE? And was there no other package available, for example? Uh huh. Um, so on the first point, yes. So some models may take few hours to run, 
um, for more advanced, if you look at the particular or on, on the big uh, accelerator study, this can be a few days. And um, sometimes the system did not change. So in this case, we would just uh, rerun something that we know the output for. So um, here is a, a big gain. And as for um, having already a package library for that, we, we of course did uh, a search and, and tried to see what's, what's out there. And we did not find a, a tool that would exactly match our, our requirements. There is a, a tool uh, developed in Java. But that would require us to then go for via Py4j and, and uh, mm -hmm. a bit complicate our our stack. Plus, it did not support natively notebooks, and, and, and that was our our one of our requirements to, to rely on notebooks. Okay, thanks. We have uh, one more question yeah. in the room. Uh, thank you for your talk. It's really nice to see how this works in action. Uh, so the examples we've seen have um, a very strict order in which the models are run. Are there more exotic examples where you iterate over two models that feed into each other and you try to get them to converge? Or you have multiple versions of a model side by side? Uh huh. Yeah. Thank you. That was a good question. So when two models require one another, this is called code simulation. So we indeed run one and, and the other. And to resolve that, we would have a model which is code simulation calling to internally. So that way we, we can run the two and respond one with result. So you encapsulate them in another model. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And run until conversion. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so it looks like we have no more questions. So once again, thank you, Michael, for your very interesting talk. Thank you.